Okay, so to start, we're going to talk about this, this relationship between individual preferences and social preferences. And the way we'll illustrate this, if we were in person, we would play this really fascinating game. Again, you can do this as like a parlor trick at home once you can start having parties again after quarantine. Um, it'll be fun and super nerdy and everybody will love you. Um, what I do typically in person is at this point I give everybody in the class four cards, um, four face cards here, two red cards and two black cards. So everybody in the class has these cards. And then what we do is through multiple rounds, each one of the people in the class has to decide to give two cards to the public pool. And you get money, fake money points, depending on what you give to the pool. If you keep a red card for yourself and you give away a black card, you get four imaginary dollars for every red card that you keep. So if you keep both of your red cards, you get eight dollars that round. Um, if you give away both of your red cards, you get zero dollars personally for yourself. So that, that's how this works. Um, um, the black cards are worth zero if you keep them or if you give them away, they're just kind of there as something you can give away. So imagine you keep both of your red cards, you get eight dollars. The, and if we just look at it that way, there's no incentive to actually give away red cards because you're just giving away money. Um, where the incentives get messed up, though, is if you give away a red card and put it in kind of this general public pool where everybody's putting two, red, two cards at a time, um, everybody in the class gets a dollar for every red card that shows up in the pool. So that means if there are 30 people in the class and 15 of them put red cards in the middle, um, then that means you get $15 for free um, in addition to whatever red cards you keep. So if you decide to keep both of your red cards and 15 other people decide to put one of their red cards in and you get $8 because you get four for, the, for each of the ones you kept, so you get eight, plus you get the 15 that are out in the pool just as bonus dollars. So you end up with whatever 15 plus eight is, $23 which is a super good deal for you because um, you didn't have to do anything to get those free $15. It just came from the public good. And so what we do in this, in this simulation is you're not allowed to talk to each other. You're not allowed to coordinate with each other at all. Um, we just start doing rounds of this. Everybody puts in two cards into the pool. I count up how many red cards there are, and then everybody adds up their own personal points. And the goal of the game is to win, is to get the most number of, of points possible. Um, and so what happens inevitably, you can probably predict this, is initially in the very first round, lots of people decide to start putting red cards in the middle because um, you're acting in, in the public interest. You want everybody to get lots of points. Um, if nobody puts any red cards in the middle, then nobody gets any bonus points. And so people want to kind of act in, in the public interest. So in the first round, it generally happens in a, in a class of 30, I generally get 15 to 20 dollars in the middle. Um, and then we do another round and it starts decreasing every single time. Um, it starts going down to 15 and then to 10 and then to 8 and then to 7 and then to 6 um, because there's actually no incentive to give stuff to the middle. Um, if you're trying to maximize your points and get the most dollars that you can, you want to keep both of your red cards, but you also want every other person to donate to the middle um, because that means you get everybody. So if you're in a class of 30, for instance, and every single person um, puts both of their red cards in the middle in this pot, then every single person in the class will get $60, which is a ton. Um, there's no way you can get that individually. If you just kept two of your red cards, the most you can get is $8. And so if you can get every single person on board and collectively donate everything to the middle, then you get $60. If one person decides that they're gonna figure out a way to get everybody to give to the middle except that one person, then that means 29 people are gonna give their stuff to the middle and one person is gonna hold back their two. So that one person is gonna get $8 for keeping the two. And then they're going to get $58 from everybody else sticking their stuff in the middle. So that person takes off with a ton of money. But as that happens, other people will see that. And then in subsequent rounds, they'll start pulling out of the middle and they'll start pulling out and eventually it'll devolve into nothing. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing to see in real life. Um, what I do is for the first five rounds, nobody's allowed to talk and nobody's allowed to coordinate. And then after the first five rounds, I give the whole class 
um, a minute to coordinate with each other and talk with each other and try to figure out a plan. And what students generally do is they say, everybody, we need to keep going to the middle and keep giving to the middle. And everybody just kind of nods. Um, and after that, that initial time to coordinate, that next round is pretty high. Lots of people are giving to the middle. And then it devolves immediately after that because um, there's no way to punish people for cheating um, or for not giving to the middle. And so it keeps going down. Um, and then you can coordinate again after a few rounds and it goes back up high. Lots of people donate. And then it starts decreasing again. And the reason this happens is not because you are all evil people who are very selfish and just want to win. This is just human nature. Um, what happens in a situation like this is you get natural free riders. Um, if you can convince the whole class to donate to the middle and then you don't have to, first of all, there's no way they're going to notice that until the very end of the game when whoever has the most points gets a candy bar, is what I typically do. Um, and then everybody gets mad at you and you figure out who the, who the meanest, uh, most cutthroat students are in the class, um, which is always fun. Um, but like, that's just kind of the natural incentive. If you keep giving away stuff um, and supporting all of the free riders, you're going to end up with a lot less money than the people who are free riding. So in this, in this game, this public goods example here, the free riders are actually the most successful people in the game, um, which seems perverse. We don't like free riders, but it's also just what naturally happens in situations like this um, because the incentives are aligned um, in a way that makes it so you want to free ride. Um, the reason that is is because this, this pot of money that you, you donate to in the middle with the red cards is what is called a public good. Um, you may have heard of things called public goods um, when you talk about what the public sector provides, like a road or a sewage system or just general things that the public sector does. Um, technically, in economics, the term public good actually has a more specific technical term. Um, for something to be a public good, it has to meet two specific requirements. And those are, it has to be non-excludable and has to be non-rivalrous. And these are kind of weird terms, so we're going to talk about each of these in turn. Um, Non-excludable means that you cannot stop other people from using the good. So with this, um, everybody donating two cards to the middle and to the pot, there's no way to stop people from doing that or from, um, from getting the benefit of it. So everybody in the class gets however many red cards there are. So if there's 15 red cards in the middle, um, there's no way of stopping somebody who didn't donate from getting those 15. Everybody benefits. Um, so that's, that's this idea of non-excludability. Um, you see it um, all over the place in kind of more typical public goods types, type things that you think of. Um, so like a freeway is technically supposed to be non-excludable. You're not supposed to have tolls on it. It's not supposed to be like have a, have a fence where you can't get onto it. It's open to the public. Um, you can't stop people from using it. Um, in reality, you can put tolls on it, um, and lots of states do that on the interstate systems. Um, but theoretically, you're not supposed to be able to block people from using that thing. Um, a fireworks display during the 4th of July, for instance, that is non-excludable. You can't stop people from looking up and seeing um, fireworks. Um, the only way you can kind of get it excludable is if you build like a giant fence way around the perimeter of where you're launching the fireworks so that people can't get close. Um, but if you're doing fireworks up high, everybody's going to be able to see it anyway. Um, and so you can't really stop people from using it. The non-rivalrous part is another important part of this. Um, this means that if somebody uses the thing, um, one person using it doesn't stop other people from using it. So it's not going to get consumed, for instance. So with fireworks, if I look at a firework up in the sky, that does not make it so other people cannot consume that firework. I'm not like sucking in the fire lights with my eyes and making it so other people can't see. That doesn't work. Um, so fireworks are typically seen as kind of a public good. Um, you can't stop people from using them. And you, if people use them, it doesn't deplete the resource. Um, if you think of like a freeway, technically um, at a low level, if it's not like rush hour, one additional person getting on the freeway doesn't make it so somebody else can't get on. There's not like a quota system on the freeway. And so kind of at early levels, pre-rush hour, um, it is kind of non-rivalrous. Anybody can use it. Um, but 
it falls apart once you start going up to scale because um, if like a million people get on the freeway, that makes it really hard for other people to use it and it does start consuming it. And so technically, even though we have like a public road, a public interstate system, it is not a standard public good um, because you can theoretically stop people from using it. And if people are using it, um, it makes it so other people can't use it, especially if tons and tons of people are using it. And so freeways, we think of them as like a public service, public good, but they can be excludable. Um, same thing with like public education. Technically, that is supposed to be a public good that is provided to everybody. Everybody is supposed to have access to K through 12 education. Um, but if we look at it with this definition here, you can exclude people from going to school. You're not supposed to, um, but we have a whole history of, of state governments preventing people from going to school. So that, that breaks the excludability thing. And rivalry, um, it does kind of break that. If a million people go to one school, then that stops people from being able to go to that school. Um, you can expand schools somewhat, but there's, there are limits there. Um, in real life, there are very few pure public goods that are actually like exactly perfectly non-excludable and non-rivalrous. Um, and they're generally kind of weird esoteric things like fireworks. Um, again, you can't consume the light from a firework. Sunlight is another kind of pure public good. Um, you can't stop people from using the sun. And one person using the sun does not prevent anybody else from using the sun. Um, wind power. Um, if one windmill is spinning because of wind um, or a turbine, um, it's not making it so there's less wind in the world and it's not taking away the wind that could go to other turbines. That's not how wind works. And so that is kind of a, a public good. National defense is another one of these uh, public goods. Um, if a country has an army, um, in theory, that army protects the entire country. And so you can't exclude people from that. Um, and one person being born doesn't make it so that there's less national defense. Um, so this rivalry thing holds. So that is, that is what this public good idea is. You can't stop people from using it, and if one person uses it, it doesn't actually take away from others' ability to use it as well. Um, we talked about this in the last session. We had this slide here where we talked about group interests. Um, where group interests are actually a public good situation, where if you have a whole bunch of people lobbying for something, for some cause that they're really passionate about, that becomes a public good. You can't, it's not rivalrous, um, where one person kind of getting on the bandwagon for some issue, like lobbying for peanut butter, um, doesn't prevent other people from, from lobbying for peanut butter, and so it's non-rivalrous. And it's non-excludable. You can't stop people from benefiting from whatever law you end up writing because of the peanut butter legislation. Um, and so with this, with this peanut butter grandma that we learned about in the podcast, um, she had to deal with getting people to be supportive of her movement for better labeling of peanut butter and better peanut butter standards. But it was hard to get people on board because if she was successful, then everybody in the country succeeds. And so why spend your time and efforts jumping on board with this thing if you're just going to benefit later anyway? Um, and so then that generates something called free riding, which is what happens with a public good situation where everybody just kind of holds out and purposely doesn't get involved or purposely doesn't donate a red card to the center or purposely doesn't donate to NPR or PBS or to a political campaign. Um, because if you, if you as an individual don't donate to NPR, they're still going to continue to make radio. They're still going to continue to report. Um, and they have no way of knowing that you're not there um, donating. And so the incentive is structured in a way that you're not actually going to participate because there's no reason for you to do that. Um, and so that, that's this idea of this, this idea of public goods here. The reason we care about this in this class, um, one, we're the public sector, so we care about providing public goods. Um, that's why we're here. Um, but two, we keep talking about this individual level thing, where if you, as one person, decide not to donate to NPR, they're going to be totally fine. There's no reason to do it. But if everybody suddenly starts deciding to not donate to NPR, then they're not going to have funding, and they're going to have to shut down. Um, because everybody will jump on board that free riding train. And so you need some core of individuals to stay 
committed to the cause while everybody else free rides. And that's where it gets tricky because you can potentially swing in such a way that everybody just gives up and because everybody wants to free ride. Um, and so individual actions can actually mess up whole social um, movements um, and social phenomena. Where this idea comes from is this book here. This is an, an older economist um, named Thomas Schelling, who was kind of, he was like the Freakonomics guy of the 1970s, um, back before Freakonomics was a thing. And he wrote this book here called Micro Motives and Macro Behavior, where he explains this, this theory he has that individuals acting in their own self-interest can actually mess up social trends. So that's this micro motives idea. So individual motives um, can lead to different sorts of macro behavior or general social behaviors. Um, so his main thesis here is that perfectly rational individual behavior can create irrational and inferior social outcomes. Um, so again, like this idea of um, donating red cards to the center, the perfectly rational thing to do is to never donate red cards. If you want to maximize the number of dollars and the number of points that you get, you want to keep both of your red cards and hope that everybody else donates their red cards. And so that is perfectly rational. You want to get the most amount of points, that's how you do it on your own if you can't coordinate with everybody. Um, and so then that creates inferior social outcomes because if you hold on to all of your cards, you get $8. If you can somehow get everybody to donate their cards to the middle, then you personally get $60. But the only way that's going to work is if you can get everybody on board um, donating their red cards and hopefully nobody breaks that, that agreement that you come to to say everybody donate. Um, and so um, that's kind of the issue that we, that we face. Um, there are a couple different terms for this, um, this idea. One is called social dilemma. This is what the core reading talks about. Um, another term for social dilemma is collective action problem. It's the same idea. It's just that it's hard for, it's hard to get a big group of people to decide to do something in the interest of that group when you have individual incentives that kind of drive that group or drive your own individual motivations. Um, and so as a result, your personal actions, if you personally decide to not donate to NPR, that actually has consequences later down the line where other people will find out or other people will think the same way as you and it will create inferior social outcomes. Um, and so that's kind of the, the theme for the rest of the session today is this idea of individual behavior messing up um, social phenomena and social um, interactions. So. In order to, to get kind of a mathy, more analytical way of thinking about this idea of social dilemmas, we have to introduce a new language of math, which is game theory. So let's go to that section next.